I did in other modern European countries like Spain and Italy and France and Germany. Um, somehow we don't have that legislation in place here. We think it's sensible to have that minimum safety level. In I understand place. the point about health particularly, but in education, yeah. in rail, yeah. in, in nuclear, who who ultimately is going to set whatever the minimum level is? It's going to be the yeah, government, so, isn't it? So, so we'll have this uh, new law on the statute book. So that's the primary legislation. Then we'll have a secondary piece of legislation which will work through after consulting with the sector and with the public uh, about what the correct level is for that particular sector. So just go back to rail, your first example. Um, you might say, well, look, there's critical freight that needs to get around the country, uh, which is you know vital to keeping the economy um, going uh, at a, presumably a, a, a much less than a regular level, or there are critical workers who need to get around the country. And one of the things that's been very distressing on this very now protracted forever rail strike is that the people that's really hurting are not people who can work from home. Um, they're people who actually have to go to their place of work, you know, the hospital porter, the cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, people often who are the least well paid or paid in society are suffering the most from this very extended strike. So you might look to provide the bare minimum service, uh, which would help. Uh, people still you know, get around. And but do those would jobs. that minimum requirement not also fall onto the government in some of these cases to actually sit down and talk about pay with the unions who are asking yeah. them to, particularly yeah. the nurses? Yeah, and actually uh, another part of uh, what we've said today uh, is exactly that, which is, look, it's a new year, it's a good time to, to make a new start on these things. What we're offering to do is come forward with all of the data that we're presenting to the independent pay review bodies. And it's, it's, it's worth your listeners knowing, we don't just, as a government, in most cases, pluck a number out of thin air. Uh, in many of these cases, though not all, there's a public pay review body who take evidence from the unions, from the workers, from the sector and from a uh, government, and then they come to an independent recommendation. And actually, in about 85% of the time, that isn't accepted in full. Uh, in, uh, I think, 98% of the time, it's mostly accepted. So I think um, the, the pay review bodies, which have been running for a couple of decades, have been very successful. But you know this that one of the key, strikes... the key issues for nurses is that the government yeah. won't even sit down and talk about pay at all. And my point is, is there not that there should be, shouldn't there, something mm. that requires the government to move further, whoever that government is in the future, to actually deal with the issues that the unions are bringing forward? Is there a commitment in this then to perhaps give more pay to those uh, public sector workers in, in rail or the NHS to help ward off any strike action? No. So what we're saying actually is the right way to do this, and the unions asked for the independent pay review bodies in the first place 20 years ago, uh, is through the independent pay review bodies. What we will do is sit down. We'll, we'll sit down with anyone. We'll sit down with the unions. We'll sit down uh, with, 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 with any of the uh, you know, parties involved in this. But what we will do is provide our background data to it. So as we go into the 2023-24, this, this coming year's pay settlements as well, uh, we'll be completely transparent. We're asking the unions to do the same. What is it that is causing, for example, in one case, uh, the, the what, what one set of, uh, of workers, why are they asking for a 19% increase? What, what What is the justification? How does that compare with the rest of the economy, etc.? We can get all that data out there and I think actually help to I hope bring these strikes to a resolution because the damaging, not just for the economy, not just for people who you know might need the emergency services, mm -hmm. and that's why we're saying minimum safety levels, but also for the workers themselves. So I don't know what benefits from this, and we want to bring it, see it brought to a close. This idea, uh, legally set minimum levels, service levels or safety levels, is all stick. There's no carrot here on offer from the government to workers in this sector. And at a time when the government can't guarantee uh, good ambulance services, regardless of a strike day. So, so actually, I think the, the healthcare strikes are quite interesting because the Royal College of Nursing um, took, I, I thought, the, the sensible approach of saying, look, we will agree at a national nationwide level what uh, minimum safety levels mean. And they, they provided that during the strike. Uh, with the ambulance um, side of things, different ambulance trusts did different things. There was no nationally agreed uh, level of service or safety. Uh, and I think that's just fundamentally dangerous. If you had a heart attack, uh, you need to know um, that there is an ambulance that's going to be available one way or the other. So what, all we're trying to do is kind of create a sort of overall platform. It's what countries like France and Germany do. There are we're not now, though. I mean, the, the, the ambulance service is absolutely on its knees. 
It was certainly the case that the, the combination of um, COVID and all the backlogs uh, and the issues of, of um, social service, social care, the long term care stuff, um, has meant that there's a there's a huge backlog. Again, actually, the prime minister yesterday stood up and said this is one of his five top priorities. Mm. Uh, and and, it, and it's not just words which I think listen to this and go, well, it's just politicians are saying that. Actually, your listeners may not be aware, but we've actually hired 32,000 more nurses since 2019. So we, we are increasing yeah. both the number of nurses and the amount of cash going to the NHS massively. Uh, but of course, like all global health services, we're also recovering from the, the COVID crisis couple as well. A couple of quick things before we finish. One of your colleagues, Alex Chalk, said to us yesterday that pay rises in the public sector would be an unkindness his word, as it would increase inflation. Do you agree that a, a pay rise for nurses or anyone else in the public sector is an unkindness? No, uh, and then we actually we're offering pay rises. So um, not 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 to lose the fact that actually nurses alone, actually when all the rest of the public service was being frozen, the NHS alone, I should say, NHS workers, 1.2 million people actually received £1,400 more on average last year, even whilst the rest of the public service was being frozen. And this year, there's a pay offer on the table that the Independent Pay Review Board has proposed for nurses in the NHS. Uh, so but, it's not inflationary, but, is it? Uh, but a pay what rise. I was going to say is, of course, there's a point at which it becomes inflationary. If you chase inflation... What point is that? Yeah, well, at the moment, it depends where inflation is. But if you chase inflation, currently over 10%, then you end up in a cycle where you never get out. It's what happened in the 70s. You never get out of an inflationary spiral. We need to get out of that. The other thing, one of the other five uh, pledges the PM made yesterday was he wants to see inflation halved this year. And it looks possible to do. The, 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 the projections are that that will happen, according to the independent projections. Yes, without the government the doing anything. Is, well, I was going to say the danger is if you chase inflation through higher pay awards in the public sector, uh, then you'll end up in a position that where you, you, everyone is hurt in the end. And right. We don't want to be in that position. I, I just think it might not be lost on people that the when inflation goes up, it's not the government's responsibility, it's exogenous events. But when it comes down, the government claims a win. No, I, I, look, I, look, I think that's cheap, actually. I, I don't agree with that. Uh, I, I don't come on your programme to try and deny things are the government's responsibility. I think most of your listeners will... So inflation kind of rising is the government's that, responsibility? Well, of course, of course, everything's the government's responsibility. I think, having said that, the, the, you know, your listeners will understand that Putin invading Ukraine pushed up energy prices and inflation globally. Uh, but I don't seek to uh, demur from it. I don't seek to sort of run away from the responsibility of governments uh, uh, on inflation any more than I would seek to not say that government was something to do with the fact that right now, as you and I speak, we've got the lowest unemployment that we've mm -hmm. had for the best part of 50 years. Both sides of those are things which are connected to the government. And that's what a grown up conversation involves. Two very quick things, two grown up issues on your brief. Why are you pushing to subsidise a, a private company, a Chinese company who own British Steel to the tune of £300 million as, re as was reported over the Christmas period? So we, we have steel industry in this um, country. It's pretty important to uh, the future uh, of our country. People will argue whether you know, G20 countries all tend to have their own steel um, industry. Uh, and people will argue over the level of support. I didn't particularly recognise the figures I saw over Christmas reports in the papers. Right. But, but you know, there are, but, but um, you know, it's a fact of matter that uh, there are many important jobs. There's an important advanced manufacturing sector uh, at stake here. And so it's well, always it's, my job it, to be looking at that very carefully. If it's that important, Secretary of State, why, don't the, why doesn't the state just own British steel? Why is it, why is it sold to a Chinese company with a £27 billion turnover who will then receive a taxpayer bailout of £300 million? Well, look, I don't think the actual ultimate ownership here is the the, the issue, particularly since steel has been very loss making globally uh, in the last few years. You might be very pleased that the British taxpayers, not all your listeners might be, hasn't been owning that uh, increasing debt. Uh, it's not been a profitable um, field to be so it's in. it's not that because, important. Uh, no, I was saying there's, it's not a very profitable sure. area. You were arguing it should be state controlled and state owned. That would mean that these losses were all on the taxpayer. I'm not sure that's the immediate answer. But um, but there, there is a, you know, and again, uh, as a business secretary, I understand that it is very important that we consider, you know, where our, our industrial uh, importance lie, where industrially important sectors lie. And we do have to think about those things. Mm. Um, but as I say, the figures I saw mentioned over uh, the Christmas break aren't figures that I okay. immediately recognise. Can you rule out that you're going to add 12p to the price of a litre of petrol? That I'm going to 
Uh, could you, <laughs> yes, could, I well, think could, I should entirely rule it out. Oh, where, fantastic. Where, where, so you're not going to do it. Is the government no. going to do it? Not that I'm aware of. No, where's that story? I haven't even seen that one. Oh, it's in the it's in the uh, it's in the um, the OBR report following the the autumn statement from Jeremy Hunt that there's a there's a the budget is balanced on the back of a 12p fuel duty increase in the litre of petrol, which the prime minister was asked about the other day and didn't rule out. Well, look, uh, I think probably the answer, the standard answer is uh, I don't try and preempt future budgets. But more specifically, I can what I can say factually is for the for twelve years we've frozen duty on petrol, meaning that given inflation, in real terms, the, the, the government's take has been coming down. So I, I do know that we've been doing that uh, uh, for a very long time. And uh, well, for budgets of the future, I'm afraid we will have to we will have to wait till the future. Grateful for your time. Grant Shap, Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. Five to six, Joe's in Welling Garden City on the issue of the strikes. Hi, Joe. Hi, Tom. Um, first of all, I thought it was a great interview with Grant. I thought you asked some really good questions there. Oh, I was calling in, uh, two points I wanted to make. I think the first one is, I think we're asking the wrong question here, and I think the government is prompting us to ask the wrong question here. What we're talking about is restricting people's ability to strike effectively, and the level to which that would happen, obviously, is up for debate, and the details aren't clear. Um, But for me, I think what we really should be talking about is why is... Why are we in a situation now where all these public services, which the government is responsible for, why are all their workers now feeling the need to strike? None of them want to. They lose money doing this. But why are those services in this situation where it's it's clearly so bad and these people are so desperate that they are striking in order to improve their conditions? And I think the second point I want to make, which is particularly applicable to rail, is I think we need to be very careful about restricting people's ability to protest and to strike because it's my understanding that the government legislated previously to make it so um, trained workers can't run the services for the public without taking any money for tickets. Yes. And so what they've done by doing that is they've made it so the only thing that... um, rail workers can do to protest their, yes. their working conditions is to completely stop all did services. Happen, listen, Joe, did that happen in Japan? Was it Japan or Canada where they basically said, the, I think it was, was it, oh, I'm getting this all wrong, bus drivers or train drivers, either in Canada or Japan, <laughs> said, mm. we're not taking any money today, you can come on for free. Um, and and they, they brought to the negotiation table the government of whichever country they were in, because obviously that's a situation that couldn't carry on, but it is not possible here. Yeah, so that that's my understanding, yeah. yeah. All right, well, it was loose on my understanding of it. But, Joe, listen, appreciate